All right, today we're going to talk about mobile stuff, and I want to review what we went over last time and then extend it and talk about what we're going to talk about and not talk about, well, no, I want to talk about the stuff that we're going to talk about, and I also want to talk about the stuff that I'm not going to talk about, which seems ironic, I know, but um, there you go. Um, <coughs> there's, uh, in general, three basic approaches for taking a website and make it work for a mobile environment and a desktop environment. And those approaches are, number one, a layout that works for all. That'd be the ideal, right? I mean, if you just had to create a web page and some CSS, and that was perfect for everything, all right? Uh, it's probably most likely to do this when you have a relatively simple website. So the simplest website, yeah, you probably could do or come close to this. Second approach is to have one set, and this would be one set of HTML files, one CSS file, or by one set of CSS files. Second would be to have one set of HTML files and multiple CSS files that are applied via media queries. I guess there's other possibilities as well, but the one we're going to talk about is media queries. And the third one is to simply have essentially two websites. Possibly more websites even, because you could actually, if you wanted to, have a flip phone website, a smartphone website, a desktop website. But two websites for the most part, if we're just going to talk in simplistic terms of mobile versus desktop. Two websites, which would be two sets of HTML, two sets of CSS, and you'd have some server-side code, which would be a traffic cop, which would direct the site visitor to which of the two sites they should visit. Uh, server-side code can look at the request that comes in and say, hey, this is a request from a mobile device. Send them to the mobile version of the site. This one is from a desktop. Send them to the desktop version of the site. Okay? Essentially, this is just a tiny snippet of code. So effectively, doing this is essentially just like creating two websites. And then you have a little snippet of code that redirects people to uh, where they should be. All right? So just think of making two websites. All right? Would be this part of it. And then a little server-side code, which we will not cover. Now, all of these could be enhanced by server-side and or client-side scripting. For example, through client-side or server-side scripting, we could make it so even though they're two different websites, it's sharing stuff. So you don't have to write two complete websites. You can share pieces of the website between, between the two versions of it. And that would typically be done through server-side scripting. We could do use server-side scripting here, and we could use it here too, or client-side scripting. Now, this part, yeah, it's just like making two websites. We're not going to talk about this in this class. So we're going to kind of forget about this solution. All right? We're not going to talk about this part, all right? Because we only study a bit of uh, our client side scripting and we do that at the end of the semester. Maybe at the end of the semester we'll rewind a little bit and, and talk about the implications of that. But 
our focus is going to be on these two things and just from the HTML CSS perspective and actually mainly from the CSS perspective because in both of these we have one set of HTML it's just a question of do we have a CSS file that works for everything or do we have two CSS files that we use media queries to switch between all right and again there's all kinds of overlap between these. There's a possibility they have hybrids and mix and match certain characteristics and all that. This, by and large, is called responsive web design. And I think we've mentioned that term before. And if we haven't mentioned it, it's probably pretty easy to figure out what we mean. Uh, what do you suppose we mean by responsive web design? It changes the response. It responds to whatever like device you're on. Yeah, the page that you're viewing reacts to, responds to, changes based on what you're viewing it on, the device that you're viewing it on. So uh, it may look a certain way with one device, might look a different way. Look, It, it will look, uh, I, I don't want to say it will look a different way, but uh, side, different device sizes will be accommodated. The page will respond to it. So, what do you think, based on that description and maybe stuff that you've already known or researched or whatever, what do you think some of the characteristics? We've, we've studied responsive design without calling it responsive design. We've studied aspects of responsive design anyhow without calling it responsive design. What do you think some of the things that we're going to do in a page that's responsive? Yeah, and how are we going to size those things? Well, no, media queries is the second solution. This is without media queries. This is a one-size-fit-all CSS. We're going to use percentages. So we're going to rely on percentages rather than absolute sizes. And we're going to do that for fonts. We're going to do that for sections of the page. And we're going to do that for images. So we're going to specify an image. Instead of having an image being 400 pixels wide or something like that, we're going to resize it to be a certain percentage of the page. So I'm going to take the prototype that we had last time, and we're going to visit a resource about responsive web design, and then we're going to try to make a responsive version of that. And you know what? We probably already have close to a responsive version uh, through one of them. So let's go, probably the first one we have is a responsive version. So let's go and pull that up and let's uh, insert uh, an image on the page as well. So let's just pull one of these pages down just so that we have a starting point so we don't have to start from scratch. This is week 10, right? So we'll pull down this guy. start out with this as our initial page. All right. And right now actually it's not really it's not completely respond it's a little responsive. <laughs> All right. Again, we talked about uh now sometimes jokingly this is called a, a jello uh layout 
because the Jello layout um, uh, moves a little bit, but it doesn't move as much as liquid did. So let's go, and if I'm not mistaken, did you know this, by the way? If you want to, if you know the page that you're, if you know the website that your page is at, that you're looking for, you can put site colon and then put the name of the site afterwards to do a Google query. That's very nice. So I remember on a cool website called A List Apart, there was a good article about responsive design. So if I Google responsive design, I'm going to get a million different pages. Whereas this will show me, this will probably narrow it down to show me the page that I want. Um, so. I think this is the one that I want. Alright, here's media queries that we can talk about. Um, it's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Actually, responsive design sort of encompasses with number one and number two. So, Look at the, let's look at the first aspect of responsive web design, and we'll come to media query. All right. Uh, the first few steps that you can do is make everything uh, everything ought to be a percentage. All right. So no absolute sizes for anything, including images. So therefore, we are going to use uh, a percentage for an image. So let me get an image to put. Uh, on this site, and let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Is, um, I think I remember when I was doing percentages on mine, I had issues with like the height. Being yeah. Percentages. Is that something you can't put in percentages? Well, typically you're gonna be worried about the width okay. of it. Yeah. So I mean. let's find a public domain photo, so I don't have to worry about giving credit. like a good public domain photo. A couple of kitties going fishing. And if you notice it is fairly big. I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go in here, copy this in, and I'm going to go here, and I'm going to say, put the image here. If I don't specify any size on an image, it will be the size that it is. All right, which you're kind of fortunate. That, pardon me. It fits pretty well. It fits pretty well. Yeah, but we can even do better than that. So let's go in here, and 
let's go in and let's put in the CSS. With, let's do 80%. Now, on occasion, uh, I will use numbers, absolute numbers for like margin, but you could also use it for, um, you could also use uh, percentages for that. So like maybe, you know, 2% auto. So percent auto, border radius. percent border width five percent and so on so I'm going to give a width of all these to 80 percent as opposed to the absolute number Changing the number to pixels. I'm going to leave that at one pixel. I'm okay with that. With set. Now the one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add to this, in addition to changing these to percentages, is I'm going to add um, something for the picture, so that the picture is only 100% and has a maximum width. So my picture is in the section, so I'm going to say section image with 100%. Now, depending on the kind of image you had, if you had a very small image, you probably wouldn't want to go 100% or you'd want to put a maximum width on here. Because otherwise you're going to make the image actually bigger than it actually is and you'll get distortion. This image is... 600 by that, so I'm going to put a maximum width of 600 pixels. That way, if 100% of the screen was 1,000 pixels, or 100% of it was 800 pixels, let's say, I wouldn't make it 800, because if you try to make an image bigger than it is, it's going to distort it some. So I'll say max width 600 pixels. So that's sort of an acceptable use of that. Now let's go and look at the page. Oh, I messed up. I think I messed up with. The padding and the margins. Let's get rid of the padding. Yeah, let's change the padding to maybe 1%. to be bigger. Um, so let's make the width have a 
percent. we go. And as we make this bigger or smaller, it adjusts. So this is an example of responsive. Again, I could spend a little more time tweaking it to get it looking exactly how I want, but that's the idea of responsive. Notice how even the image changes as you make it smaller. The one thing I'm going to put in here as well is the viewport. All right, so let me go in and has a viewport in it. Good. And I could go and look at this in a mobile device by going here, more tools, developers tools, toggle device toolbar, and I could pick a Galaxy 5, a iPhone 6, and so on, and see what it would look like. All right. So that is sort of most of what we need to do with responsive. Again, it's one spreadsheet, but it works reasonably well across uh, multiple sizes of things. So we could tweak it and, and make it look better if we wanted to spend some time, but I think you have the idea. So that's like two-thirds of responsive. The other one-third of responsive is where we can actually put media queries in to go and apply different style sheets under different conditions. Now here's usually the way media queries work. Usually, you have two style sheets. This is, this is sort of the basic form of that. You have two style sheets, one after the other. All right? The first style sheet applies to everyone. The second style sheet is added and overrides stuff in the first style sheet. Okay, that is called the mobile first strategy, where you create a style sheet that you're going to use for mobile, and then you add on to that additional features that you want on the desktop. And the second style sheet has a media query, which means sometimes it applies, sometimes it doesn't apply. So, style sheet one applies to everyone. Style sheet two only applies to desktop devices. That's the mobile first strategy. And we do that via what's called a, a media query. So, let's say this is the way that we want our mobile site to work. All right. In fact, let's, let's fiddle around with it. By the way, if you're going to use font sizes, you would use M's, not points or pixels. So maybe I'll say uh, font size 0.8 M. A what? EV? I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, I, I mean, could be. Yeah, I, I just haven't seen it before. Okay, so this is going to be the look that everyone is going to get. And then we're going to add on stuff for the desktop, which makes sense, right? It makes sense to use a mobile-first strategy because mobile designs we had just talked about 
uh, last time are typically simpler than desktop designs. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a basic mobile design and we're going to add stuff onto it. All right, to make a more complicated desktop design. You can actually go the other direction. You can start out with the complicated involved desktop CSS and take away stuff to form the mobile version. That's called graceful degradation, where if you're, you're moving to a less powerful platform, it does it gracefully. It doesn't mess up. All right? And about the only time I would do that is if I already had a website and I wanted to make it more optimized for a mobile device. Typically, if I was doing something brand new, I would use this method, where the first style sheet related to the mobile device, and then I would add stuff on for the desktop device. So, let's go in here and Google Media Query. There's a couple of ways you can do media queries. All right. You can actually put them on the whole CSS file, or you can put them on parts of a CSS file. We're going to take the approach of putting them on the whole CSS file, at least initially. So, Media queries are used, by the way, for things other than other than uh, mobile devices. You can, for example, have a printer version of your page, right? You probably have all seen that. If you viewed a page, maybe a news article on a website, and you go to print it, typically the print layout is just the text. It doesn't include the ads or the images or whatever. It'll just be the text. So media queries were originally sort of designed for that, but they have the benefit that they can be used for mobile stuff as well. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to put this in my HTML and I'm going to create a desktop CSS file. Change this to min. Alright, and I'm going to make sure this works before I go on. And again, the way this works is notice that the desktop one is after the first one. That means that this CSS is going to apply, and this CSS will overrule anything in this CSS. All right. Provided that the situation, the device being viewed on, is a screen. Screen means typically a computer screen, not a mobile screen. And it's at least 480 pixels wide, which is pretty minimal requirement. So let me create a new a new file. And let me start out by giving A 
Actually, let's give it a different background image. Actually, let's do this. So indecisive. Let's move the background image. Let's take the background image out of the main CSS. So the mobile device doesn't get a background image. That's more typical anyhow. So I'll make the background on the mobile device black. And I'll make the background on the desktop CSS be the image. Okay. So, let's go and view the page. All right, there we go. This is a desktop device, and therefore it has the background image that I said I had wanted in the, mobile, in, in the uh, desktop CSS. If I view this now, on a mobile emulator, notice the background is black. All right, let's make it a little more vivid. And I'll make the background on the mobile device be white. And I'll use the image on the desktop version. I started off with something simple. I didn't want to spend 20 minutes up here lecturing and find out I made a small mistake. So I made sure that just the mechanism of applying both style sheets in the correct situation worked. So let's change that to have a background of white. Now if I view that in a mobile device, the background of the page is white. If I view it in a desktop environment, the background is the image. So already I've gone and I've taken the CSS that is in the second file and apply it conditionally. And remember how it works. And this is a case, sometimes people have asked me, like, does it matter the order that you put CSS in? And a lot of times it doesn't. But in this case, it does matter. Because in this case, this gets applied to everything. This gets applied if you're talking about a computer screen that is at least 480 pixels wide. So with that, we have a situation that on the desktop version, we get the background image. On the mobile version, we get just the color white. So already we've made a small change for that. Now we don't have to stop there, right? I can, for example, keeping in mind that typically for a desktop version, I want uh, more columns is, is likely, all right? Uh, what I can do is I can actually make uh, and maybe apply a responsive grid, all right? So, Let's go on and let's look at the last thing we did last time, which was the flex thingy. So let's go and make that work in the desktop version.
because that's right, I'm using a flex, flex box. see how this looks. Let's go and save this and let's view the desktop version of it first. All right. Almost the way we want it. All right. I'm going to make the navigation so that they're stacked vertically. And there you go. So this is the page on a desktop device. Exact same page on a mobile device is like that. So we kind of, we've made the page really even more responsive still than what we had originally. Originally, it was sort of a, uh, a page that the sizes of things conform themselves to the size of it, uh, the size of the container, but the basic layout stayed the same. Here, even the layout changes. We've gone from a one-column layout on the mobile version to a multiple-column layout in the desktop version. How do we do that? Again, we do that by creating two CSS files. Where the two CSS files contain the same stuff, all right, the second one overrules if the second style sheet gets applied. All right, so in this case, we have two style rules, two, two CSS files. Everyone gets the styles in this one. So everyone gets to start out all these style rules. If you're a screen that is at least 480 pixels wide, that's sort of a shorthand way of saying if you're on a computer screen, then you will get this CSS file. And this CSS file will overrule anything in the first CSS file, but only for those devices that this second CSS file applies. So everyone gets the first CSS file, computer screens gets the second CSS file. And where there is overlap between attributes, for example, this one says the navigation is 80% wide. This one says the navigation is 20% wide. Which one wins? Well, if this CSS file applies, this one overrules the first one because it is physically after the first one. All right? Questions about that? Yes? I just had a question. Essentially, there's two CSS files. Is that the same as if you embed the media query in the one CSS file? Yeah. You could, you could do this. You could do this through embedding the media query inside the CSS file. We'll, we might look at that next time. I, I, I generally do it this way. Um, just want to make sure it's doing the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it, it effectively would do the same okay. thing. Yeah. Now, we can do even more than that. We change the layout. We can actually make content disappear. All right? How do we make content disappear? By setting the display to none. All right? So, I could go in here and say images on the mobile version I don't want to display at all. So I can say display none. And if I do that then, ah, it displayed in both. Why? Because I didn't override it in the second one. 
So I'd have to go and override it and say I want it to display in the desktop version. So displays in the inline ver uh, displays in the desktop version. Displays on the desktop version. I go into the mobile version of it and I don't get the image at all. Again, remembering all the stuff that we talked about in, uh, in uh, uh, when we first talked about mobile devices and, and optimizing for mobile. Typically, we want our pages on a mobile device to be simpler. We could get rid of other content the same way. Here I have one paragraph. What if I had some other paragraphs here? I'm going to give them a class of secondary, meaning they're of secondary importance. And I might have might decide that. Well, if it's of secondary importance, I don't want to see it on the mobile version. It will just distract. I could create a style rule that said anything with a class of secondary by default will make it invisible. And then on the desktop version, I could say, well, I want to see the stuff, even the stuff that's of secondary importance. So now, if I view it here, all I see is the one paragraph. If, however, I view it on the desktop, I see... after I've saved everything, I see three paragraphs. And if I view it on the mobile version, I only see the one paragraph. So even though we're talking about HTML code, we can style it effectively to get rid of it in a mobile environment. If we don't want to cl uh, clutter the pages with images or extra text or whatever, we can go in and we can put in uh, to make it visible in a desktop environment where, because typically again, on a desktop environment, the designs are more complicated, you have more content. On a mobile one, the design's going to be simpler and you want less content. So this is the mobile first approach to responsive, where the first thing we do is we create the style sheet for the mobile device. And that will be the foundation style sheet for everyone. And then we add on to it the enhancements to it for the desktop device. We stack the style sheets on top of each other, put the, the, the desktop one second, and write a media query so only the desktop device gets that one. Questions about this? Now, the other thing you can do is you can 
uh, take and do the graceful degradation where you start with the desktop version of the CSS and then you trim away stuff on the mobile version. The principle is exactly the same. It's just where your starting point and ending point is. In graceful degradation, your first style sheet contains everything and your second style sheet trims stuff away from it. In the mobile first, your first style sheet contains just the essential stuff that you want to be shown on the mobile device and your desktop style sheet adds stuff to it. Questions about this? My suggestion is to experiment. All right? Take and put stuff in. Now remember, there's only a, there's only a question of what's going to get applied if you're dealing with the same attribute. Right? So, for example, Let me get rid of the font family here from the desktop version. I'm on the wrong one. Yeah, it is. You're right. So I got rid of the simple responsive one, but that's okay. Thank you. I still get the fonts that are specified in that. Why? Because I didn't override them in the desktop version. It's another example of how cascading style sheets cascade. I didn't say anything in the, in the desktop version about what the fonts are. Therefore, I get the fonts that were defined in the basic main style sheet. However, I do define what the background URL is for this, so I get that little background tile image here where I don't get it on the desktop because I overrode that in the desktop version of it. So if we look at this, the basic style sheet simply has a background color of white, the desktop style sheet has a background URL. So that overrides the background color. It takes a little bit of thought to do this, right? Because depending on how you do it, there could be, you could have a lot of your stuff in the main and just have the stuff that you want different in the desktop one. And how big the desktop one depends is, uh, you know, it depends on how similar you want it to the uh, mobile version of the site. Questions about this? Experiment. That's my suggestion for this. Try it and uh, try to make this so that you have a page that looks different uh, depending on where it's viewed. And again, it's a responsive page. All right. Questions. Ideally, making two style sheets like this will take less time than making two totally different style sheets from scratch. Because the first style sheet you make is going to have a lot of stuff in it that is going to be shared between both the mobile and the desktop, more than likely. The second style sheet you create in this scenario, the desktop one, is just going to have the changes for the desktop. So it probably won't be a complete style sheet as big as the first one. I guess it could be, depending on the circumstances, but in this case, notice how the, the first style sheet is bigger than the second style sheet. All right, that's all I had today. We'll continue about this uh, a little bit next time, and then away we'll go to whatever the next topic is. I'll go to the lab and open it up, then I'll come back to get the files.